Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Power of Low Volatility, New Research, New Results, and New Solutions. My name is Matt Hogan, and I'm the president of North America for ETF.com, the host for today's webinar. I'd like to thank PowerShares for sponsoring our webinar today. Specifically, I'd also like to thank three of the most uh, esteemed experts in the space of low volatility and smart beta investing that I know who are going to lead today's discussion from PowerShares. They are Craig Lazara, Managing Director of Index Investment Strategy for S&P Dow Jones Indexes, John Ferrer, Vice President and Director of Equity ETF Product Strategy for Invesco PowerShares, and Nick Kalivas, Senior Equity Product Strategist for Invesco PowerShares. It's a real treat to have all three gentlemen on here today because they are true experts in the space. Before we get started, there's just a little bit of housekeeping that I'd like to cover to make sure we all get the most we can out of today's webinar. First, I want to thank all of you who have joined us this week for our full suite week-long series of smart beta webinars. If you missed any of the presentations from Monday through Thursday, you can access replays of them on our website, etf.com. Second, if you haven't visited yet, I'd like to invite you to visit our new Smart Beta channel at etf.com slash smart beta. There you'll find an overview guide from etf.com on smart beta, foundational research on smart beta topics, and the latest articles covering the space. The channel is sponsored by the sponsor of today's webinar, Invesco PowerShares, and they have their own materials coming to that page soon. Third, for today's webinar, we'd like to invite you to be an active participant in the discussion. The team at PowerShares has presented an exceptional deck, and they're great folks with deep knowledge. Please ask them questions throughout today's session. To do that, just open the Q&A box in the upper left-hand side of your screen, type in your question, and hit send. We'll collate those questions and answer as many of them as we can at the end of today's talk. If you don't see a Q&A box in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, please click on the red Q&A widget on the lower part of your screen, and it will open up. Beyond that, um, one little tip in terms of getting the most out of today's presentation, if you'd like to expand the screen that you're looking at, you can click on the lower right-hand corner of the slide window, and that will allow you to size that slide window to whatever is the most appropriate for you. I've looked at the deck that the PowerShares team is going to present today. I think it's truly exceptional. I'm excited to hear what they have to say. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to John Ferrer of Invesco PowerShares to lead us through the presentation. John? Hey, thanks, Matt, and thanks to everyone for dialing in for this fifth installment of the uh, Smart Beta Week here at ETF.com. With, uh, as Matt mentioned, the, uh, today's uh, session is really going to be drilling down on low volatility investing. We're going to kick off the discussion with Craig and I uh, spending some time reviewing research surrounding low volatility as well as providing just general background characteristics and really definitionally what are we talking about when we talk about low volatility. From there, we're going to recap the empirical support for low volatility, evidence that supports the global existence of arguably the most persistent anomaly in finance. From there, we're going to dig into some important considerations when it comes to portfolio construction, specifically thinking through the ramifications based upon whether the portfolio is constrained or unconstrained from a sector perspective. And then lastly, my colleague Nick Kalivas is going to walk us through some research and analysis that looks at using low volatility as a core holding in an investment portfolio and explore some different ways in which investors can think about implementation to achieve uh, specific portfolio objectives. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, well, by way of backdrop for our discussion today, I always think it's a good place to start with the simple math involved uh, in recovering from portfolio drawdowns. For investors on today's call that endured the bursting of the tech bubble or the global financial crisis, the math on this slide is a stark reminder of the reality of the holes that were dug for many investor portfolios, holes that were deep and out of which it took years to climb to, to full recovery. As we stand here today, volatility continues to be very much a top investor's minds. Why? We believe there are reasons, the reasons are many, but just to mention a few, an aging demographic that's going to be transitioning from the accumulation phase of their financial plan to starting the distribution 
phase and the critical need to mitigate volatility and drawdown within their portfolio. Also, by most accounts, we are very likely in the late innings of a historic yet aging bull market one that will shortly become the third longest since the Great Depression, having produced nearly 20% annualized returns in the six years since the March 2009 bottom. Also, we have a backdrop of divergent global monetary policy with record low yields in the U.S. and negative rates in Europe that have caused investors that would typically implement a standard bond allocation really being hesitant to do so. With the paltry yield and the buzz about a bubble in bonds, it may not be worth the risk. And lastly, it's the persistence of ge geopolitical risk and global economic uncertainty, whether it's tensions with Russia, turmoil in the Middle East, or the possibility we'll see a Brexit and the impact that that could have on the EU and the broader economy. So let's... So with that as a backdrop, let's take a look at the relationship between risk and return. Most investors have an intuitive sense, sense that risk and return go hand in hand. The thought is, since it's, it's impossible to earn investment returns without taking any risk, it should follow that as risk increases, so should returns. As demonstrated in the graph on the left, at the asset class level over an extended multi-decade time horizon, that relationship appears to hold. That is, in the long, in the long term, stocks have been more risky than bonds, but have also been higher returning. So over a sufficiently long time horizon, the data seems to support that risk, when you look at it once again across asset classes, does seem to be positively related to returns. Looking at it within, within asset classes, the graph on the right plots the return of the stocks of the S&P 500 over a trailing 10-year uh, time horizon relative to their historic beta. Here you can see that there really doesn't seem to be a clear relationship with risk uh, increased risk resulting in increased returns over longer time horizons. As you can see with the slope of the regression line, the relationship actually appears to be negative, with higher beta stocks actually delivering lower returns than the lower beta stocks. So while the capital asset pricing model, which states that expected returns of any stock as a function of its market risk or its beta, continues to be taught in business school, in reality, risk doesn't appear to be positively related to return. In fact, it appears to be negatively related. The charts on this slide further demonstrate the apparent disconnect between risk and return. Here we're looking at data for the largest uh, 1,000 largest, uh, 1, U.S. stocks going back to the late 1980s through March of this year. The chart on the left simply shows risk, which here is measured as standard deviation of returns in relation to absolute return and then sorted by volatility quintile, once again, across the largest 1,000 U.S. stocks. If risk were positively related to return, you would expect that as you send, ascend up the volatility quintiles to groups of increasingly risky stocks, you would expect to see increasingly higher returns when, in fact, you see return actually decreasing, with the most volatile quintile actually delivering the lowest absolute return relative to the other less risky quintiles. The chart on the right, also looking at data that goes back to the late 1980s, calculates al alpha across the volatility quintiles based upon the CAPM model. And in contrast to what we would expect, we see positive alpha being generated in the lower volatility quintiles and significant negative alpha being generated in the most volatile quintile. Further demonstrating that investors have not only historically been reward rewarded for shouldering more risk, they in fact have been punished. There are a number of other academic studies that have been published in the various academic journals that actually go back to the late 1960s that reached the same conclusion. So as we've examined it, our own research supports the conclusion reached by numerous academics. And that really is, is contrary to con uh, conventional thinking, and that risk does not appear to be positively related to return. So with that, let me turn the discussion over to Craig Lazera to dig into the different approaches to implementing low volatility and his thoughts on it as a factor of return analogous to other established factors. Good. Thanks, John, and th thanks to all of you for, for being with us. Um, as, as John mentioned, the research on low vol goes back quite a while, and I'll, I'll mention some of it in a few minutes. But uh, let me start out by, by dis defining the two general ways in which people have sought or investors have sought to capture this, uh, this low volatility effect, so to say. Um, 
and to do that, first of all, we, we need to define exactly what these strategies are, are trying to do. And I, I like to define them in, in terms of what I, I will typically call the, the two Ps, protection and participation. What I mean by that is that low-vol strategies, generally speaking, try to deliver protection from falling markets. And I hasten to say it's not complete protection. We're not talking about any form of portfolio insurance, uh, but you want to attenuate uh, returns uh, or bad returns in bad markets. At the same time, you want to participate in rising markets. That's the second P. And at, at the same time, I have to tell you, it's not full participation either. Uh, but if you attenuate the returns on the way down, attenuate the returns on the way up, that's what delivers this low volatility pattern of returns uh, that, that John has been describing uh, some of the academic research about. There are two general ways to get there. Uh, there are lots of lots of sub ways uh, or more specific ways, but two general ways uh, to implement a low vol strategy. One of them is what we sometimes will call a rankings based approach. Here we've called it a, an inverse volatility approach, and that's a very simple uh, technique. What you do there is, is simply rank the stocks in the S and P 500, for example, or or any index in which you're interested find out which ones had the lowest volatility on a historical basis, and they become the basis of your portfolio. In the case of S&P 500 Low Vol, for example, which is the index we launched uh, about four years ago and on which PowerShares has, uh, has the, the largest uh, low volatility ETF, SPLV, uh, we simply take the 100 least volatile stocks in the S&P 500 and, and weight them inverse to volatility. Uh, one of the virtues of, of that approach, in our view, is that it's simple easy to understand. Anyone who wants to check to see if we've done it right can, can easily do that. Uh, and it is unconstrained. What I mean by that is whatever the 100 least volatile stocks are, that's what goes into the portfolio. If that means some sectors are substantially overweighted, that's what happens. If that means some sectors aren't there, that's what happens. Uh, and in that way, you generate, uh, and, and John will show you some examples later, generate a very attractive pattern of return that attenuates the downside and the upside, providing protection and participation. There's another way of doing this, uh, it's, it's fair to say, and we've called it here optimized the minimum variance. Sometimes I'll call it constrained the minimum variance. That's a more complicated uh, way of, of, of getting at the same problem. What you do there is specify a risk model, use an optimizer to, to, to drive the risk model to identify a low volatility portfolio. Uh, and and in, in that way, try to achieve these these benefits of, of protection and participation. The, the characteristic of these optimized strategies, and it's, it's not just optimized minimum variance strategies, it's, it's all optimized strategies. A characteristic of these strategies is that they are necessarily heavily constrained. I, I forget uh, which professor it was years ago that defined optimization as error maximization, but he had the right idea because what happens in the case of, of, an, optimized, of an optimizer is if there's a mistake in your data, a bad estimate uh, of, of risk or return, the optimizer is going to find it and put a big bet on it. So in order to avoid uh, the difficulties with, with optimizers being error maximizers, Anyone who uses one will put on certain constraints in his portfolio. For example, very common in the case of low volatility or minimum variance strategies, you have to have at least plus or minus 5% of each uh, sector weight in the index you're, you're, you're talking about. Uh, and that, that gives you, in some circumstances, a very different look than the, than the unconstrained or rankings-based approach uh, will, will create. Now, what both of these factors, or both these approaches, rather, have in common is that they posit the existence, or they recognize the existence, given the evidence that, that John's already shown you, they recognize the existence of, of what I might call a low volatility factor of return. And when I say factor, think of that in, in the same way that, that Fama and French uh, wrote about factors in, in 1991. Remember, Fama and French... Uh, said that in addition to the stock market beta, which comes from the capital asset pricing model, that small size and cheap valuation were factors of return. If you want a definition, think of a factor as, as an attribute uh, uh, or quality with which excess returns are associated. Uh, and low volatility, like small size, like cheap valuation, like momentum, sometimes people talk about momentum as a factor, like all those things, is a factor of return, a quality with which excess returns are, are associated. Now, the difficulty with, with low vol as a factor is that it challenges what we think we know about the relationship between risk and return. Uh, what I mean by that is you think back when you started to study finance in college or the CFA program, whatever it was, 
you learn very early on that risk and return are two sides of the same coin. Higher risk means higher return. Uh, you want to earn higher returns, you have to accept higher risks. So to say that low volatility is a factor of return kind of flies in the face of, of, that, uh, of that intuition. Uh, because it, it, what we're saying is that, that low, volatile, low volatile stocks, less risky stocks, have higher returns than, than high risk stocks. Uh, that, that doesn't seem like it should be. And I, I often tell financial advisors when I talk to them about low volatility, if, if it seems confusing, if you're confused, that's okay, because it is confusing. There, there are some explanations for it, and I'll, I'll come to them in a, in a moment. Uh, but it, it, does, it does give you a certain amount of cognitive dissonance, and it's important to recognize that. Now, low volatility investors initially were what I would call active quantitative managers. They'd read the literature. They're, they're aware of some of the studies that, that, that John was citing and had done others of the same nature. Uh, we as index providers are relatively of latecomers. I mentioned that we started about four years ago uh, with, uh, with our S&P 500 low volatility index, uh, and we've had a, a good amount of success since then. Um, important for you to understand when you, when you evaluate the performance of a, of a low volatility strategy, whether it's one that we in PowerShares are involved with or, or a competitor or, or an active strategy of some sort, a couple things to keep in mind, three, three really. One is that if the strategy is successful at identifying less volatile equities, then you'll get a less volatile portfolio. I mean, that's the that's kind of obvious to say that, uh, but first of all, the strategy has to be able to identify stocks that are going to be less volatile going forward. The second thing to say is that if a strategy can capture the low volatility anomaly, in other words, if this tendency for low vol stocks to outperform high vol stocks persists, and the strategy can capture it, then the result is going to be not only a less volatile portfolio, but also a less volatile portfolio with better risk-adjusted returns, and in some cases, with better returns, period. Finally, it's important to say, if, if a strategy is pitched to you, and, and the person doing the pitching says it, it should outperform in all market environments, I, I don't know what that is, but it's not a low volatility strategy. Because low volatility, remember, coming back to what we said a few, a few moments ago, is designed to give you protection in down markets, participation in up markets. In up markets, it may well lag. That's the price of having the participation uh, or the protection from the down markets. Uh, so those are, the, those are some things to remember. Now, I, I mentioned a moment ago that this, this notion of a low volatility uh, anomaly or low volatility effect is, is confusing. Uh, and and it, has, it has confused uh, not only people like, like John and Matt and me, but it's confused uh, professors uh, who are quite famous uh, going back some time. I'm going to take the explanations not in the order that we've shown them in the slide, but kind of in, in chronological order because uh, the literature on this topic of low volatility goes back at least to the early 1970s when, when Fisher Black and Myron Scholes, who soon thereafter became famous for their option pricing model, were writing about the low vol effect. And they thought of it as a, as a challenge to what was then the new capital asset pricing model. The capital asset pricing model, of course, says that a stock's expected return is proportionate to its, to its beta. So I mean, high beta stocks meant high volatility, but, but high beta stocks didn't, uh, didn't outperform like they were supposed to. And, and this, this troubled uh, the professors. They came up with an explanation uh, that they call uh, leverage aversion. We call it here leverage constraint. And what, what that explanation basically means is that if you want a beta, let's say, of oh, let's say oh, 1.5, what the capital asset pricing model says you should do is own the S&P 500 or, or whatever your base index is, but own the S&P 500 with 50% leverage, and that's how you get a beta of 1.5. In point of fact, what Black and, and Schultz pointed out, in point of fact, many institutions and individuals can't do that. They're, they're sometimes legally constrained, practically constrained, or just don't want to have leverage. If they want a beta of 1.5, they'll go out and buy high beta stocks. Uh, and that means they create a demand for high beta or for high volatility simply for the sake of owning that volatility to create a, a leverage position that they could, a, a position they could otherwise get by leverage when they don't want to use leverage. So that's the earliest explanation for, for low volatility, uh, the low vol effect that I know, leverage, uh, leverage aversion, leverage constraint. A related, uh, or, or rather some, some later explanations, uh, 
uh, came from this this notion of the notions of behavioral finance. Now, behavioral finance, you, you'll all realize, or behavioral economics generally, in contrast to, to classical mean variance optimization that we do in in finance, behavioral economics says. Oh, before people are, are anything, they're people, and that means they have systematic biases, they make mistakes, they do dumb things, and so let's try to understand them as they are and not uh, as we think they theoretically ought, ought to be. Uh, and so behavioral finance gives rise to a number, a study of a number of what are called uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive biases, that's a fancy word for mistakes, and, and two of them uh, we've, we've mentioned here. Uh, the preference for lotteries is a is an important one in understanding the low vol effect. Uh, what the preference for lotteries says it, it well, starts out with thinking about lottery tickets. You know, what, and, and it asks the question, what is the expected value of buying a lottery ticket? And the answer is the expected value of buying a lottery ticket is negative. Somebody who buys a ticket should expect to lose money. Well, from the standpoint of, of mean variance optimization or utility maximization, therefore no one would ever buy a lottery ticket, except that we know that billions and maybe trillions of dollars of lottery tickets get bought and sold all over the world every year. So what that means is classical economics has no explanation for this phenomenon that we know really exists. What behavioral finance, behavioral economics says in contrast is that some individuals are willing to risk a known amount for the chance, however small, of becoming humongously rich next Tuesday. And therefore, they are willing to buy lottery tickets, because maybe it'll be their number. Um, now, if you think about that, that, whether that makes sense to you or not, you have, you have to admit that people do buy lottery tickets, and, and you know, there's not much classical explanation for that. So transfer that insight into the realm of the financial markets. And what do you have? Well, what are, what's the analog of, of a lottery ticket in the financial markets? The analog of a lottery ticket is a high volatility stock. Uh, may come to nothing, may not do very well. It could be the next Apple, could be the next Google. And so some investors will buy volatility for volatility's sake simply because that might be their chance to have a big payoff. And from then on, the argument that behavioral finance makes is identical to the one that, that uh, Black, and Mer Black and Merton and Scholes made, which is therefore high volatility, high beta stocks get overpriced because people buy them uh, for the sake of their volatility, that takes them above fair value and therefore a, pro a, a portfolio or a, an index that, cost, that uh, systematically excludes them will do better. And that's what low volatility strategies do. Related to this concept of preference for lotteries is something that behavioral economists talk about a lot, and that's overconfidence. What that simply means is we, we're, we, all, have, we all overestimate our own abilities. Uh, if we ask a, a bunch of people in a room, how many of you are above average drivers of automobiles, more than half put their hands up, guarantee the exercise has been done, done many times. Uh, and so that overconfidence bias sometimes operates particularly with estimates of future growth for stocks. So if you overestimate, you're overconfident, overoptimistic about a particular stock, it may be a more volatile stock. You may pay too much for it. It's a related factor to that preference for, for lotteries that we were talking about. Final explanation uh, is, 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 and I'll illustrate this in a, in a, in a moment, uh, is what's called the, the limits to arbitrage. Uh, and the limits to arbitrage argument is, is in part an argument about why the low vol anomaly exists and in part an argument about why it might persist. One of the features about anomalies generally, any, any oddity in the financial market where it seems to be possible to make, uh, to make money, is that the news that the thing exists attracts interest, investor interest, and the investor interest makes the thing go away. So what we've illustrated on the slide you're looking at now is, is two hypothetical portfolios uh, or, uh, which are eva potentially evaluated by investors with different objectives because it's important to keep in mind that not all objectives, not all investors have the same objective. Some investors are more focused on absolute return uh, or, or absolute risk-adjusted return, and they tend to focus on the, the ratio that we call the, it's called the sharp ratio, which is, which is a ratio of the excess return that a portfolio generates in relation to the volatility that you had to endure in order to earn that excess return. So on the basis of a sharp ratio, given these, two, given these two sample portfolios, hypothetical portfolios, an investor who was 
absolute or risk-adjusted absolute return oriented would prefer portfolio A. It has a higher sharp ratio. You get half a unit of return for every unit of risk you took as opposed, uh, as opposed to portfolio B where you only get uh, 0.2 units of return for every unit of risk you took. In contrast, many investors, particularly institutional investors, focus on what's called the information ratio. It's related to the Sharpe ratio, but has some important differences. Because the denominator of the information ratio is the portfolio's tracking error with respect to whatever its benchmark is, the S&P 500 or, or whatever other base uh, universe uh, is, is being used. So in the case of these two portfolios, the tracking error for portfolio A is higher than the tracking error for portfolio B. That means it will fluctuate around its benchmark, its base index, in a wider band, which, by the way, is typical of rankings-based low-vol portfolios. They typically have fairly wide tracking errors. What the, the information ratio does is to compare the excess return of the portfolio relative to the market to the tracking error relative to the, to the, to the, markets, to the market basket that was used. In this case, what you see is if you're deciding which portfolio you like based on the information ratio, based on the concept of relative return, you will prefer portfolio B rather than portfolio A. Now, we show you this example, which it admittedly is, is, is hypothetical uh, and uh, uh, somewhat, somewhat arbitrary, to illustrate an important point. And the important point is that rationally, some investors might prefer A, some investors might prefer B. A is much more like a low volatility strategy. Uh, it, uh, it offers a higher return, it offers a higher return, a ratio of excess return to volatility. It has a relatively high tracking error relative to its base index. Some investors will rationally prefer that. Some investors will rationally prefer portfolio B because they don't like the tracking error that portfolio A gives them. What that means is that, that there's at least a theoretical argument to be made that the low volatility anomaly, even though everyone knows it exists, can persist because investors who are more oriented to the B strategy won't try to arbitrage it away uh, and, and therefore it may, it may last for quite some time. Well, this has been what I've, been, I've said are basically uh, theoretical points. Uh, I want to turn back to, to John now, who will give us some more evidence of, of how things actually work uh, in, uh, across a number of, of uh, low volatility, a number of, of, of markets. Thanks, Craig. And, and exactly to that point, one of the questions that may be on participants' minds at this point is the degree to which this anomaly, anomaly persists globally, given that we really only examine data thus far based upon U.S. stocks. The next couple of slides, which I'm going to cover rather quickly, recap some research that was undertaken by Narden Baker and Robert Hogan, uh, published back in early 2012, that looked at data from 1990 through 2011. And similar to what we saw earlier in markets across both developed and the emerging world, lower volatility stocks have consistently shown to deliver higher absolute returns with lower risk when evaluated over extended time horizons. The Baker-Haugen study compared the highest and lowest risk deciles over this multi-decade uh, multi time horizon. And as you can see from the charts on these two slides, the lowest risk decile consistently delivered higher absolute return, lower risk, resulting in a significant uptick in risk-adjusted return as measured by the Sharpe ratio in every single country. This, ex this study also examined the rolling uh, three-year returns over the same time frame, thus evaluating the frequency with which low volatility stocks outperform high, high volatility stocks. And as you can see on this slide, there are times actually when high, uh, high volatility does outperform, but they are very few and far between. The area colored in purple above the line represents periods in which the lowest risk decile outperform the highest risk decile. And once again, as you can see, low volatility outperforms the vast majority of the time. Now let's turn our discussion to what we believe is an incredibly important consideration when evaluating the various approaches uh, that Craig walked us through to implementing low volatility. So while that slide loads, that slide loads, I should say, as Craig uh, as Craig mentioned earlier in his discussion on the different implementation approaches, one of the critical differences between the rankings-based or one-over volatility approach and minimum variance is the fact that one employs sector constraints, whereas the other uh, does not. In the case of optimized minimum variance, 
uh, if the methodology did, did not include constraints, as Craig pointed out, the resulting portfolio could have significant concentration uh, in specific sectors, and therefore constraints are employed, resulting in a more broadly diversified portfolio. The next two slides address two case studies in which we examine sector allocation for both of these approaches. Once again, a constrained minimum variance approach and an unconstrained low volatility, uh, kind of one over volatility approach. The first study is, the, is looking back at the tech bubble. On this slide, you can see in the colored band that extends from the left to the right, this shows the range in percent weight in technology from the years 1999 through 2003 that would have been required within a constrained minimum variance approach. For illustration here, the assumption is that the constraint uh, is that the, the uh, constraint is that it should maintain a weight within 5% of the cap weighted uh, index, and that's certainly not unrealistic for standard approaches, as Craig pointed out, to minimum variance uh, portfolio construction. The purple line toward the bottom is the weight in technology during this time using the one over volatility of the rankings-based approach that, once again, is not constrained from a sector perspective. We all know the story. From 2002, uh, from 2000 to 2002, the technology sector declined by a cumulative 73%. During this time frame, the 100 least volatile companies within the S&P 500 consisted of only two stocks from the tech sector. The tech sector represented 29% of the S&P 500 index in January of 2000, and it averaged 21% of the weight over the next three years. Thus, when you look at it, a constrained low volatility approach would have been required to start the period with at least 24% exposure to technology, and maintain an average of at least uh, an average of 16% exposure during a period when the sector lost nearly three quarters of its value. And as you, might ex as you might expect, the second example, which you know, certainly provides a, an extreme uh, uh, market event, uh, you see a similar analysis here taking a look at the global financial crisis, with this example, of course, being a little fresher in most of our minds. Here the chart, once again, showing the, the colored band that extends from the left to the right that shows the range in percent weight, in this case in financials, from 2006 to 2009 within a constrained minimum variance approach. For illustration here, once again, the assumption is that the constraint is required to maintain a weight within 5% of the cap-weighted parent, parent index. The purple line uh, that is uh, you see moving through the, through the graph, starting kind of higher upper left there and then very drastically moving uh, down quickly, is the weight in financials during this time using a rankings-based approach that, once again, is not constrained from a sector uh, sector perspective. So uh, we all know the story once again for those that lived through it. Through uh, From October of 2007 uh, through to February of 2009, the market declined 51 percent, with the financial sector actually dropping 76 percent. And it was during this time that the unconstrained low volatility basket had an average weight of 3 percent, dropping from 30 in June of 2007 to just 4 percent six months later in January of 2008 a constrained methodology would have been required, uh, as the band shows there, to, sh uh, to hold at least an average of 11% in financials over the crisis period. So while some have called the unconstrained approach a, a bug within the methodology, at Powers we actually think of it as a, a clear benefit or a, or a feature. By implementing an unconstrained approach along with a regular rebalancing discipline, this enables a portfolio that is focused on low volatility to have the agility, if you will, to navigate away from sectors that may be in turmoil by dynamically allocating to wherever, wherever low volatility resides within the market, instead of being tethered to the weights within a parent index. So with that being said, let me turn the conversation over to, Nick, uh, to my colleague, Nick Kalivas, for some thoughts related to implementation of low volatility within a portfolio. Okay, uh, thanks, John. Um, what I'm going to do is try to walk through some ideas on how to apply low volatility investing to your portfolio. And we're going to start off here by um, trying to make the case that low volatility should be part of a core holding. So this graphic here supports the case for using low volatility as a core holding. In this slide, we are showing how the least volatile quintile of the S&P 500 has performed versus the S&P 500 index on an absolute and risk-adjusted basis using three-year rolling returns. We're trying to go across a, a market cycle. The absolute return is shown by the purple line, while the risk-adjusted return is indicated 
by the orange line. And the risk-adjusted return essentially adjusts the return by the standard deviation of return to come up with that risk-adjusted value. And when you dig into the results, what you find is that the low volatility quintile posted a higher return than the S&P 500 index on a risk-adjusted basis just over 75% of the time. And on an absolute basis, 62.5% of the time using the, the data between 1995 and March of 2015. And as the graphic shows, the most frequent period of underperformance occurred during the late 1995 to 2000 period during uh, uh, the technology bubble. But uh, really, since the end of the, uh, the tech bubble and, and, and kind of in the period uh, past 2000, uh, there has been a more uh, persistent outperformance of the low volatility quintile. Moving to the next slide, what we have here is a slide that, that helps to kind of uh, display how an unconstrained low volatility portfolio can add value by lowering risk and increasing return. So what we have uh, here is essentially a, a, a graphic which is showing the relationship between return and, and risk. Um, so if you look at the top left uh, corner on the graphic, you'll notice that a 100% allocation to the least volatile quintile shows the greatest return and lowest risk. And if you go to the bottom right hand of, of the graphic, you'll see that 100% allocation to the S&P 500 index displays the lowest return and the highest risk. And in between, you can see in 10 uh, percentage allocation changes kind of what the risk return trade-off is. So given this analysis, I, I think it's fair to assume that one might want to consider a low volatility strategy as being a core holding in a portfolio because it's going to provide the potential to earn a higher return with potentially lower risk than the S&P 500 index, which is, I think, thought of as, a, as, as an important um, benchmark in the equity market. As we turn to the, to the next slide, I'm going to present a, an efficient frontier. And I'm going, to, I'm going to do this to kind of show how you can combine uh, the low volatility quintile uh, of the S&P 500 with uh, a momentum before, uh, portfolio to essentially enhance uh, your return. So what we have here is kind of a, a different mixtures of a momentum portfolio and a low volatility portfolio. The momentum portfolio was derived from data taken from the Kenneth French Data Library. And if you go to that library, you'll see that it provides returns on various uh, investment factors. It's, it's quite popular and well known. And then the low volatility portfolio was based on the least volatile quintile of the S&P 500 over the 1992 to 2014 period. And you'll note that by adding the least volatile quintile to the momentum portfolio, it is possible to get a, 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 a superior risk-adjusted return. And that was really achieved by adding uh, somewhere in the 10 to 20 percent uh, uh, mix of the least volatility quintile to the momentum portfolio. Uh, the risk per unit, uh, excuse me, the return per unit of risk was about the same in, in this allocation. So this, uh, to summarize again, is another way where you can mix in low volatility uh, in, in investing into a portfolio and essentially uh, improve your outcome. Now, what I want to do is take this uh, to, the, to the next step, and that is to look at using uh, low volatility to help reduce the need for a fixed income allocation. So we're going we're gonna to use low volatility to decrease the risk of a, of a portfolio. And maybe put another way, we're going to use a low volatility stocks um, that might be seen as a substitute for a fixed income allocation. So what do we have in this graphic? This graphic compares an 80% allocation to the least volatile quintile of the S&P 500 and a 20% allocation to the Barclays Ag Index uh, in the orange, that's the orange dot on there, to a 60% allocation of the S&P 500 index and a 40% allocation to the, the Barclays Ag Index in the purple. And when you do that mix and you look at the risk and return over that 92 to 2015 time period, what you see is that uh, the basket of low volatility stocks uh, was able to generate a 29% greater return with 5.1% less risk. And that leads us into our, our next slide here, um, which is going to 
take the idea of using low volatility stocks as a fixed income a substitute a step further. Uh, and what we're, we're going to try to uh, play out here is the idea that a low volatility portfolio might be an effective way to generate a stream of income solution from for investors who are warmer towards uh, substituting uh, equity for some fixed income investment in their portfolio. And this may be helpful as you look at the distribution phase of an investment life cycle. Uh, the potential benefits of a low volatility equity portfolio for income generation may include capital growth, growth in withdrawal, and a hedge against inflation. So what do we have in these, uh, these graphics here? These, the, these graphics in the table sum, summarize a simulation uh, which we set up where we invested $1,000 in three different portfolios, the low volatility quintile of, of the S&P 500, the S&P 500 index, and then the Barclays Ag uh, Bond Index. And we essentially generated this, this uh, between 1992 and 2014. We went on to say, well, what happens if we take out 4% of the portfolio's value at the end of each year after the portfolio was able to earn the return um, in which the asset uh, it, it was invested um, was able to produce? Uh, the new balance less the distribution was allowed to grow the next year before the process was repeated each year ending in 2014. And so the graphic uh, on the left essentially shows uh, what that starting yearly balance would have been. The orange line displays the least volatile quintile, the gray line the S&P 500 investment, and then the purple line uh, the Barclays Ag uh, investment. And you'll notice that the least volatile quintile of the S&P 500 was able to generate the greatest uh, price uh, appreciation, and that was actually significantly more than the other two investment strategies. Uh, the graphic on the right displays a yearly distribution value, which is 4% of the year-end balance. Here, the portfolio total payout was greater in the least volatility quintile of the S&P 500 than either of the other two uh, uh, investments, and, and that can be seen at the top of the table. Uh, furthermore, the growth of the distribution was significantly stronger, and um, I, I think was uh, a, a helpful uh, return in terms of providing or protecting a portfolio uh, against uh, higher inflation. Inflation in this time period actually rose 2.3%, um, and uh, that was uh, essentially at a faster rate than what the distribution growth in the bond investment was able uh, to uh, produce. Now, I do want to take just a second here and talk about uh, using low volatility as a tactical tool. Um, some uh, people choose to, uh, to use it this way. And uh, in this slide, what we have is a, tra a tactical strategy, um, and it basically looks at the value of a $10,000 investment in a switching strategy between the least volatility quintile of the S&P 500 and the Dorsey Wright Technical Leaders Index, which is based on a momentum methodology. So you, you can see the switching strategy in kind of that purplish line, and then you can see how that compared against the S&P 500 index in uh, the red line. Now, um, the switching strategy we used here was, was very simplistic. Uh, when the S&P 500 was above the 200-day moving average, uh, on the um, on a monthly close basis, then it was long uh, momentum. When the S&P 500 was underneath the 200-day moving average, uh, we there was a switch over to uh, the low volatility quintile. A 2% filter was used to essentially eliminate any kind of uh, whipsaw or false signal, try to cut down on the risk of that. And if you look back to um, really the inception of the Dorsey Wright Technical Leaders Index there in March of 2007, you can see that this switching strategy was actually able to uh, produce a return that was greater than uh, the S&P 500 um, index. So now let's just take a look and see how uh, low volatility has uh, performed in different ranges of market uh, volatility. So this slide is essentially showing the return for the S&P 500 um, low volatility quintile. That's in the orange. And it's then showing the uh, return for the S&P 500 uh, index. That's, that's in the, uh, the grayish um, uh, uh, bar. And then the difference uh, between the two and the bluish bar. And you can see that as we go to the x-axis, we have those returns grouped by uh, different ranges of the VIX, which we'll use to represent uh, equity market volatility. And you can see that the low volatility quintile tends to underperform when volatility is in that 10 to 19 
area based on the VIX. But as volatility rises, you see that the low volatility quintile uh, tends to generate excess uh, uh, performance. And it tends to occur on, a, on a, almost what looks to be a linear basis, because as volatility really starts to expand, you see the low volatility uh, quintile show um, a greater excess return. Moving then to uh, the last slide, it just I, I think this will, will help to uh, illustrate how uh, low volatility performs in bull and bear markets, meaning that it's going to show you that um, when you get in the bull market, it is going to participate, but it's, it's not going to participate to the, the full extent. And when you get into a bear market, um, it, it's, it's, it's going to provide some, some cushion but it's not going to you know, hedge away all your risk completely. It goes back to what Craig said about uh, the two Ps. And so you can see in the, in the major uh, rallies we've seen between 1992 and current that essentially, on average, we saw the low volatility quintile of the S&P 500 underperform the S&P 500 index by about 13.2%. Uh, in the flip side of that, however, during the down markets or those bear markets, it tended to outperform about 18.5%. So we see it uh, outperforming on the down, and we see it uh, lagging on the up. And so uh, with that, let me uh, uh, pass this uh, over to uh, John, and he can uh, provide some concluding thoughts. Hey, thanks, Nick. And, and just a, a note for those listening today, Nick, in the interest of time, Nick did uh, uh, end up skipping a few of the slides that you may find interesting through a download with some further analysis on low volatility investing that I think are, are really insightful. So, But before we move to the question and answer segment, I just want to briefly recap some of the main points from today's discussion. You know, first of all, as we said at the outset, we believe there's a multitude of reasons that risk management is a top uh, of mind for many investors, and that really accentuates the need uh, for investors to be evaluating volatility management solutions. Uh, and learning from you know, uh, recent experience, the global financial crisis as well as the bursting of the tech bubble, strategies that can help avoid lar large portfolio drawdowns may help investors have the wherewithal to stick uh, with their financial plan. And as we you know, really pretty extensively, I think, discussed here today, research supports the existence of a low volatility anomaly that persists on a global basis. And we believe, as Craig pointed out, will persist uh, going forward based upon the behavioral and structural biases that we walk through. We also believe a, a deeper evaluation of low volatility strategies is really key for investors as they consider the options available for implementation. As in the examples that I walked us through, an unconstrained index methodology provides the needed flexibility to adjust the portfolio to reduce or even eliminate exposures to volatile sectors during times of turmoil. And lastly, as Nick walked us through, low volatility strategies can serve as a portfolio core for investors focused on managing risk while also driving long-term portfolio returns. So as we transition to the Q&A uh, segment, I just want to highlight um, the broad suite of, uh, of Invesco PowerShare's smart beta ETF solutions that are focused on low volatility. PowerShare's partnered with S&P back in 2011 to launch the first uh, the industry's first low volatility ETF, SPLV, and since that time is really focused on building the most comprehensive suite in the ETF industry today. So Matt, with that, let me pass it back to you and see what questions we might have. Thanks. <coughs> thanks, John, and thanks um, to Craig and Nick as well. I thought that was an exceptional presentation. I'd remind all our attendees that if you'd like to ask a question about what you've just seen, um, feel free to use the Q&A toggle on your screen. We'll ask as many as we can. Um, one, you know, I just want to start with a very uh, sort of practical question since we have an advisor-focused audience. How should an advisor talk to their client if they're moving them into uh, a low-vol portfolio from a standard cap-weighted index, whether that's part or all of the uh, portfolio? What should they emphasize so that the, the, the end investor will know what to expect during different market environments and won't panic at the wrong time? What should they say? Well, I'll, I'll start with that, uh, Matt, if I can. The, I think the, there are two things to say, and, and, and they're equally important. They go back to the, 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 the two Ps that I, I started out with. And, and maybe the most important thing to say is that, that the low vol strategy should underperform if the market is very strong. Uh, what you don't want to do as an advisor is, is to, is to let the client think uh, 
uh, when the market's up 30%, this will be up 35, because uh, it's designed not to work that way. Uh, so uh, uh, it's important to tell them what it won't do. And, and then I think it's important to say, you know, the price for foregoing some of the upside in a really good year is, uh, you won't get hurt as badly, or at least statistically speaking, you would, would not have been hurt so badly uh, in the declining years. So think of it as a as a a, a way to uh, to ride out the market's uh, peaks and troughs in 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 a much more uh, comfortable and congenial uh, and smooth path. Uh, but that means uh, the upside is high. Right, Matt. I would just that. add to that. I would just add to that, this visual that we used early on, making up for lost ground can be difficult. I think this is really instructive just to understand the math of what you see with drawdowns and what it truly takes to recover and just the, the sensibility of employing a, a low volatility strategy once you look at the recovery, amount to get to recovery, it really, we believe, makes a lot of sense. Yep, absolutely. Do you guys, um, one question from the audience, uh, do you guys publish upside and downside capture ratios, and are those important when evaluating and comparing uh, different low ball strategies? Yeah, um, yeah this is Nick. I, I, I'll take that. We, we do put that out in, uh, in some of our, uh, we, in our marketing pieces where you can, you can see that, and uh, I think it is very helpful in terms of trying to quantify kind of what, has happened um, uh, on the upside and what has happened on the downside. I think it helps to make the case. It provides statistical evidence, uh, but but certainly uh, that uh, is is available in some of our marketing materials. Yeah, hey, Matt. This is once again. This is John. Just real quick, the, the statistics on that. Just uh, obviously with SPLV, our our strategy has the longest track record. Up capture on that since its inception has been just a little bit south of eighty percent. Uh, but the down capture has actually just uh, only been at about 43%. So you can see that nice ratio between cap capturing much of the market's upward move, uh, once again, to the tune of about just short of 80%, while uh, only participating in roughly 43% or so of the downside move. So just some stats to right. on a little bit. No, that's great, and that gets to how you how you can talk to clients about that, you know, relating that to their real-life portfolios. Um, Craig, you presented some great, uh, great thoughts on different reasons why this low volatility um, anomaly, if you will, will persist. Is there any sort of worry or any reality to the worry that the fact that we're doing webinars on it and there are ETFs that cover low volatility and it's, you know, it's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal will eliminate that anomaly over time? Well, it, it's it's arguable. I don't I don't think it's likely to to happen as for the for the reasons I I gave. But but here's a here's a, a, another way to to think about the the question, Matt. Um, in order to in order to answer the question, you know, will it last? You have to have at least a, a working theory as to why it happened in the first place. So let's let's go back to the, the behavioral finance uh, idea of preference for lotteries and say, is there a way to kind of quantify uh, you know how big the lottery effect is. Now, here, this is a fanciful example, but you'll you'll see you'll see where I'm going with it. Think back to when Twitter went public, which was what a year and a half or so ago, maybe two years now. Uh, I believe it came public at roughly 26 bucks a share, uh, if memory serves, and it ended that the first days uh, the first days uh, trading at about 40 bucks a share. So about a $15 appreciation. Now, I would like to argue that the selling shareholders were all insiders. It was a private company at that point. Uh, they were pretty well informed. So when, when they said they're willing to sell at 26 bucks a share, there's there's a reasonable argument to be made that that was fair value. And yet somehow uh, the, the the thing ends up uh, on on that day. 15 bucks higher. That 15 bucks times the number of shares of Twitter outstanding was about 10 billion dollars. Um, and now, is all of that a lottery effect? Maybe I'm exaggerating somewhat, but 10 billion dollars uh, is more than the total outstanding value of all U.S.-based ETFs specializing in low volatility, and that's one stock in one day. So, I think we've got a long way to go. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, let's see. Another question that just came in from the audience. You know, one thing about this strategy is it will have higher turnover than a standard cap-weighted strategy. Do you have any data on after-tax returns, capital gains, distributions, that sort of thing? John or Nick? Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was had you on mute. Um, yeah, just, uh, since inception, the um, that's really the beauty of the ETF structure. 
uh, the strategy being delivered through the ETF. Uh, capital gains, uh, the, uh, the strategy has not made any capital gains distributions. And I don't have exact uh, turnover stats off uh, top of my head. Uh, it certainly has been a higher strategy. Once again, the, the underlying index, the S&P 500 low volatility index, uh, rebalances uh, on a quarterly basis. You end up seeing, obviously, constituent change from, from quarter to quarter. And that's how you can see, you know, as we talked about the um, uh, the differences uh, from quarter to quarter in terms of what the sector allocation can be. Uh, that's how you arrive at that. But uh, from a, a tax perspective, really that's the, I would say, the, the, uh, the beauty of the ETF vehicle at work is that it can shoulder that, uh, uh, that higher constituent change and not see uh, capital gains being distributed. Right. I'd remind our audience, uh, you have uh, a few minutes left to submit your questions. So if you have any, uh, please uh, get them in now. Guys, I'd ask just a general question. It's a very convincing presentation. What's the single biggest criticism you hear about SPLV and, and the single biggest reason people you know, uh, shy away from buying it? And, and what's your response to that? I think, uh, I think in the uh, field, what we hear a lot is people seem to paint it as a utility index. It, it gets that kind of reputation of having a lot of utilities in it. And um, I think that um, really one of the answers we, we bring to them is, is, is the fact that if you go back a couple years, it, it did have uh, over 30% utilities in it. But if you look at it right now, it's actually a little bit less than 13%. So it, it, it isn't just a utility index. It's a, uh, you know, dynamic it's, able, it's dynamic in terms of where it allocates, and it and essentially is going to move where uh, the, the volatility level warrants. So um, that's what we hear, and that's kind of, I, I think, one of the easiest responses that we can uh, make to that. Yeah, Matt, this that's is John. Great. I would just weigh in. I would just weigh in on that and just simply say it does relate it to the, to the unconstrained. And that's why, frankly, we spent some time talking about it today, because we think it's a critical uh, element to understand. Uh, and really, uh, like we said, uh, it's, a, it's a feature, not a bug, in the sense that uh, the, uh, the strategy enables through the unconstrained approach as well as the, uh, the, the quarterly rebalancing for the index to navigate away from uh, wherever a volatility might be across the, uh, across the market. So you know, if you look at a given point in time, it may have, as Nick pointed out, a higher concentration of utilities or consumer staples. But when you look at it across time, you see that those weights will fluctuate significantly. And I think the slide that we used to talk about financials, where you saw financials that 30% uh, of the portfolio, and a mere six months later dropped, and I believe it was 4%, you can see how nimble that makes the, the underlying index. And I think that's one thing, like I said, if you look at it in a snapshot in time, uh, instead of looking at the bigger picture across time against the backdrop of what's been happening in the market, then I think you can come to a deeper understanding of why unconstrained is a feature uh, of the approach and, and not a bug. Yeah, that's it. it's, it's hugely interesting. Um, we have uh, a, another question, a great one, that just came in from the audience, um, which is, have you done any study of low volatility as anomaly within sectors? And are you considering launching sector-specific low volatility funds? Uh, you put great data out on country stuff, but what about within sectors? One way to answer that, not, not directly, at least uh, for, from our end, uh, Matt, but, but one way to think about that, and we've, we've done some attribution analysis to say uh, how much of the total return increment and total volatility reduction of the S&P 500 low oil index, for example, how much of that comes from sector changes relative to the base 500, and how much comes from specific stock holdings within those sectors. Uh, and as I recall those results, roughly two-thirds of the volatility reduction comes from, uh, comes from the, the, the sector, uh, sector weighting decision, which would mean that one-third comes from something else, volatility management within the sectors. Um, I think what, what that means is could you achieve, uh, within, say, the technology sector, or financial sector, whatever, could you achieve a lower volatility result by applying a similar methodology to what we do now only within that sector? Probably. Would the result be as great? Uh, almost certainly not. And whether, whether we do the index and PowerShares would do the ETF is purely up to the people in the audience who, who let us know they want one. 
<laughs> there you go, folks. Uh, if you want it, uh, email Craig, John, and Nick and, and hound them until they give it to you. Um, gentlemen, uh, this has been a fantastic hour, fantastic presentation. We have had a request from the audience to put the uh, ETFs and tickers back on the screen, so I've done that now. SPLV, obviously the largest of the bunch, covering the S&P 500 from a low volatility perspective, but small caps, mid caps, emerging markets, international developed, uh, rate sensitive strategies, and uh, Europe currency hedge strategies. Um, I would echo the comment that there were a number of slides that we had to skip uh, due to time constraints, and there's some fantastic data on them. The slides and a replay of this presentation will be made available um, about 24 hours after we're concluded. You will receive an email alerting you to those slides. That email will also have information about how to get CE credits for all the fantastic learning we've achieved today. I'd like to thank PowerShares for sponsoring this webinar. I'd like to thank the guys on the call, uh, Craig, John, um, for, for giving such a great presentation today. Um, and I'd like to thank the audience for coming on today as well. Um, I think this has been a great hour. Please join us again for our next uh, series of webinars. Check out ETF.com for that complete list. Thanks, everyone, and have a good day.